Welcome to the Lean Frontline Podcast, where we explore how the best operational leaders innovate to drive a successful culture of excellence. This podcast is hosted by Eric Dunn, co-founder and CEO of Rever, a digital Kaizen platform. Having previously worked at Toyota and Airbus, this Lean expert works with renowned global industrial companies such as Audi, Mars, Philip Morris, and Grupo Bimbo to promote a culture of improvement done by everyone, everywhere, and every day. Let's get started. Hello and welcome to the Lean Frontline Podcast. This is your host, Eric Dunn. You're going to love our guest today. One of the challenges of developing a culture of excellence is teaching. So I decided to invite a full-time lean educator, someone with a tough audience, college students. Dr. Bradley Miller is Professor of Supply Chain Management at the University of Houston. He has more than 25 years of combined teaching and management experience focused on the improvement of both manufacturing and business processes. Brad teaches operational improvement concepts within both graduate and undergraduate courses specializing in lean enterprise systems implementation, continuous improvement strategies, process analysis and improvement, and operations management. In the classroom, Dr. Miller especially enjoys utilizing his business experience to demonstrate the real-world application of academic concepts. He uses a combination of lecture, in-class exercises, case studies, demonstrations, simulations, and business-sponsored projects so that students can learn to manage business processes and improve organizational effectiveness. I'm sure you will get a lot of ideas on how to apply this on your daily work as a change leader. Please welcome Brad Miller. Well, Brad, thank you very much for being here with us today. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Perfect. Just for um, the people who are listening um, and after the introduction that they just heard, how do you normally introduce yourself to other people when you explain what you do, what you teach, etc.? You know, very briefly at a, let's say, cocktail party or whatever. Right. Well, um, so I found that uh, that there's a lot of people that definitely have an opinion about about lean. Um, so typically I say, you know, I'm a professor at the University of Houston and they'll say, well, OK, well, what do you teach? And so I say I teach in the business uh, school, uh, the College of Business, and um, I teach about productivity and quality improvements. That's kind of how I how I start. I kind of gauge, you know, whether how interested they are. I usually yeah. throw in that um, I'll in- mention that you know some of the topics that I teach are um, regarding Lean and Six Sigma, um, yeah. and so sometimes they'll have some experience with that uh, that can begin starting a conversation. Um, there's you know, and you mentioned a cocktail party. Certainly, there's times <laughs> when uh, uh, you know when they have a, an opinion, a strong opinion about Lean based upon their experiences. And, and what do you mean about that? Is the second time that you mentioned when people have a strong opinion about Lean? What 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 have you faced in the past? Yeah, well, so some of them, you know, some people say, well, you know, oh yeah, I'm familiar with that. We're doing that at my work. It's very exciting. Um, it's something that I enjoy doing. And then there's other people that have had a, a bad experience with it. Uh, it wasn't managed well. Yeah. Um, where the culture of the organization was kind of the traditional command and control culture. And then they tried to overlay lean tools in with it and called it lean. Yeah. Uh, but of course, then that doesn't come off right. And so then they have a, a poor experience with that. Um, and it gives me the opportunity then to talk with them about how lean can be uh, can be different, sort of appreciate their, their perspective, the thing that they've experienced, but talk to them about how it can be different um, Absolutely, and what are, what I'm very curious about this particular thing. So, what are the most common misconceptions or bad experiences that you've seen? Then the ones that are negative, it's typically where they have the perception that lean is about um, we've got to do the work faster, um, and we've got to squeeze out as much out of people's um, capacity as we can possibly get uh, by forcing people to work faster or forcing people to to do things that they don't really want want to do and sort of ignoring yeah. that continuous improvement of actually making the work easier. Uh, exactly. Um, yeah. Using, you know, making people, I tell my students all the time, I say, if you, if you are using lean correctly, 
then processes become better for everyone. Are you able to deliver goods and services faster to the customer? Yes, you absolutely are. Are you able to reduce costs? Yes, you are, you know, for the organization. And at the same time in that process, it makes the work more fulfilling and uh, easier, more straightforward for the people that are actually doing the work. It makes the process better for customers where they're getting more reliable um, outcomes. It makes the processes better for the suppliers where the, su- the suppliers are able to integrate in with that better um, yeah. and for the community that the, that the organization is working uh, within. So if you're doing it properly, I, th- I think that processes then become better for everyone that's in the system. It's not a, it's not a trade-off where it gets better for one person at the expense of someone else. Absolutely. Absolutely agree with that with you. You have also, let's say, real-world business experience prior to becoming a professor. When was your your own aha moment with Lean? I think all of us, we have this, this clash of facing the Lean approach. And, and what, how was that for you? So I guess mine was more gradual. Um, and it was a learning process for me. Um, so when I started my career, um, I had the need to improve processes. I had no idea what I was really uh, doing with that. Um, my background, my undergraduate background is mechanical engineering. Um, so the best that I could do was look at processes like a system like I would as a mechanical engineer and just trying to figure out like where do all, how do all the pieces fit together you know, and how to make this work. As I started getting involved with it, I started learning from other people, then transitioning to um, different companies that were doing uh, doing different work that were approaching lean, doing uh, continuous improvement, total quality management sorts of work, started learning some concepts, then um, eventually worked for a company that had been uh, that had been practicing lean for a while and uh, so learned a lot about lean processes from them. But I will tell you, it wasn't like I worked for that company and so they um, exposed me to lean. And so now I'm a lean, you know, now I know everything there is about lean. They were doing lean. As I look back on my experience, I realize now there's a lot of ways that, that they could have improved even with their approach and their management and the culture there. Um, They were doing a lot of things, right. But I also see a lot of ways that they can improve. And I think part of that is comes from as you begin to uh, practice lean for yourself, lean's, I don't see lean as something that um, you take a list of tools or a list of concepts and then you roll it out to other people um, to make, you know, to make the organization better. It's really something you, it has to become personal for you where you are the one that's taking those things and applying them. And as you do that, you learn a lot. You learn a lot about yourself. You learn a lot about how the tools really fit together um, uh, and how that applies in different business settings. Um, And so for me, it was more of a gradual process. I feel like, I mean, now I feel like I know so much more than I knew back then. And at the same time, listening to podcasts like yours and others and and reading things, I realized there's still a lot for me to learn too. (laughs) So I'm still on that journey of trying to figure out how it all fits together. Here at Rever, we strive to innovate at the front line. We're frontline fanatics and would love to learn about your journey in continuous improvement. Set up a half-hour call with a Kaizen expert today at leanfrontline.com. Absolutely. And you're talking a lot about how to apply lean first for yourself and by yourself. And I see that you have a YouTube channel and you have a lot of examples of how to apply lean concepts, tools, and principles at home and at daily life. Why is that? What, what, was, what was that born? Yeah, well, so, um, so I, I'm teaching at a university. I'm teaching um, this, this class dealing with Lean and Six Sigma principles to undergraduate students. Um, And they have limited work experiences. Um, Some of them have internships and jobs where they're uh, they're working. I know that many of the companies that they're working, um, where they're working, are practicing or want to be practicing Lean because it's just considered uh, world-class process management. Um, But I also know that they really don't understand the fundamentals of how the culture impacts lean and really how to, to manage processes using, using lean principles. Um, and the way that I feel is the best way to learn that is by actually practicing it, seeing it happen yeah. in real life and then trying it on your own. Um, so, you know, really as, as I was thinking about how to put this together for my class, I think, um, 
teaching lean in a college classroom, you know, where you've got rows of students and someone up front talking, uh, you know, it might be like the worst way to learn <laughs> about lean. Um, but it's, you know, that's the organizational context that I'm within. I do think it's important for the students to understand the principles of lean and from an academic standpoint and how all those things fit together so that when they yeah. get on the job, they can recognize that. But that doesn't teach you how to use lean. So what I wanted to do is create for my students um, the experience of yeah. lean as if we were working in an organization and I was coaching them through and um, uh, you know using principles to, uh, to help them gain experience in how to, how to apply lean into their own lives. For a lot of them, it's not in a work setting, it's just at home. They can apply a lot of this stuff at home. So um, so I encourage them to do that. I try to show them as many examples. I tell my students, the more examples you see, you're not copying the examples, but what you're doing is you're gaining this uh, database of knowledge that you can use when you see a problem. You've got this you can pull on and, and uh, create your own creative solutions. So I'm constantly you know, improving my own processes and then I'll take video of that and post that up for my students to see. I encourage them to do the same things so that they're practicing that as well. Yeah. And, and I want to develop a little bit more on that because you work a lot with students right now. And I imagine that students nowadays, as has always been the case, in order to pay attention to any given subject, it needs to be engaging. It needs to be fun. And frankly, when we look at you know, what I would call textbook lean is not necessarily engaging or fun. So how, how can we make lean much more in, interesting, fun? If we can make it fun for students, then we can make it fun and interesting for everybody else. So what is your experience there? Yeah. So, well, with my students, a couple of things that I try to do, uh, one is having examples that they can apply in their own lives right then so that it's not, I'm going to learn this, book of knowledge throughout a whole semester, you know, several months of work. And then at the end, I'll know a bunch of stuff, but it's more that where I can teach them or talk to them about a, a topic. And I tell my students after class, you can go home, you can apply this right away. And I, so I try to give them ideas about ways that they can do that. Um, especially with c processes around, uh, cooking, you know, cooking meals <laughs> in the kitchen. Absolutely. I just find that to be it's an area where it's a process that they encounter every day. And in most people's kitchens, um, the, the kitchen has a lot of waste in it and there's a lot of places where they can make improvements. Um, you know, I talk to my students, most organizations kind of have this uh, functional layout where you've got departments, right. That are yeah. segregated and then you don't have process flow because things have to travel between the departments. Most of our kitchens are laid out in that exact same way where you've got, uh, huh. departments. You've got a pots and pans department. You've got a refrigerated goods department. You've got a boxed goods department. But when you cook a meal, the meal cuts across all of those departments. Um, and so talking with them about how to potentially transition to a uh, process layout where you've got process cells in the kitchen to um, where you've got all the ingredients that you need in just one area to make whatever it is that you do most of the time. Um, so you know, talking to them about how they can really apply that in their, in their own. That's fantastic. That's a fantastic example. And in your experience, you know, what is it that students have found most counterintuitive about lean? Because I mean, they're, they're not yet exposed to the real world. They're learning about theories and concepts of business, uh, in, in the same university as yours. And what, where have you found the most clashes with there in, in, in terms of what other subjects are teaching? Well, there's lots of areas, and I think as you and your listeners know, there's a lot of counterintuitive things about lean. What we learn, um, I think, growing up about improving productivity or improving quality, lean's somewhat counterintuitive to some of the st ways we grew up. Um, I think one of the biggest ones that just cracks me up all the time with students, especially, is the concept of just-in-time, uh, because most students have heard the term just-in-time. And uh, so they know that I'm teaching about lean. They know that lean's associated with just in time. And then they'll do something like, um, I, you know, there's a project or assignment that's due and uh, it's due at the beginning of class. And they'll come running in, you know, uh, five minutes late to class and they're, you know, tired and sweaty and they've got this crumpled piece of paper in their hand. 
and they run up to the front and thrust it, you know, at me and they say, I got it. I got it done. I, you know, but Hey, I, I'm, I did it lean cause it's just in time. <laughs> and I tell students that is like, that is not just, just in time does not mean last minute. That doesn't mean you wait till the very last minute that you possibly have. And then you rush through to get it done. Cause what happens then is quality decreases, your productivity decreases cause you end exactly. up having to do rework. Um, and, uh, you know, and then a lot of times you don't even end up making it on time. It just, it reduces quality and reduces productivity. And I tell them just in time really is a kind, and I talk to them about it in terms of Kanban and how a Kanban system works. Right. But I tell them just in time is not about doing it at the last minute. It's about doing it when you have all the tools and all the information that you need and you have a need from a customer, you're able to get started right away. I like to sort of reframe the concept of just in time as just as soon. Uh, oh, that's great. Just as soon as you have all the tools, materials, the requests from a customer all in place, you have flexibility in your schedule to get started right then to do it methodically, high quality, you know, with thought and get it done. And so I told my students uh, when they have all the materials, uh, for instance, for a project, I say, you know, if you're if you're really being just in time, then you're going to start on this as soon as we get done with class, because that's when you have all the tools and techniques and your quality will improve. Um, that's a good example. One, that's my that's probably one of my favorite ones. There's, you know, there's others too. I guess one that I see most people have a problem or a, um, a misconception most people have is that, uh, like we talked about earlier, that lean is about um, making people work faster, making people yeah. work faster and work harder. Um, and that uh, if you want to improve quality, that you have to tell people to pay closer attention. But if you want to improve productivity, you have to tell people to work faster. <laughs> yeah, so then productivity and quality are at odds with one another. You can improve one or the other, but not both. And you have to balance the two. Uh, but I, so I, I have to really work hard with students that lean is not about balancing productivity and quality. It's about improving both of them simultaneously by removing waste out of your system, You're removing waste out of the, the process. So um, we were talking about how do you engage students I, one of the things that I love about Lean is that it um, lends itself to doing uh, demonstrations and you know being sort of creating a gimba. Now in my exactly. classroom, I don't have you know I don't have like a lab gimba where students can come in, but I can create little gimba in the in the classroom. So I'll do a demo where I'll create a um, uh, a process where I take a screw and put a screw into a a foam pad, um, and there's certain requirements for doing that, measuring things and making sure it's in the right places. And um, of course, I keep my tools in a tool crib someplace so that you know the yeah. employees don't steal them. And I, I keep materials in another place. And then they, my students, watch me run around the classroom, you know, gathering all these <laughs> things. We time it, uh, and then we can remove waste from that system. And they have fun with that. I've got lots of examples like that where they can actually see those processes and see how you can actually make changes um, to them. That's one great. is on, one's on one piece flow, um, a demonstration that I do in class uh, with uh, little pennies that we sort of pass along. There's time, times for each processes, each process. We run two processes uh, side by side. One is a full batch process. The other is one piece flow. And uh, then they're able to see how um, you're actually able to get the material through faster with the one piece flow, how it improves quality, how it improves the management of that system, um, reduces cost um, just by dealing with the batch size and irregard, you know, without any other lean principles being applied to it, just dealing with the batch size yeah. and how that works. Um, and I have had many students that came up to me after that saying, you know, at the beginning of this class, I, I, well, that's just crazy doing things in smaller batch sizes. That just doesn't make any sense. But, now that I've experienced it by sitting in and being a part of that process, it makes so much more sense about how it all works now. Innovate today while meeting tomorrow's production goals. Go to leanfrontline.com to set up a call with a Kaizen expert. So Brad, can you provide an example of one of your students doing one of these long projects in the real world uh, and what sort of results they were able to achieve? Yeah, sure. I've got lots of them. You mentioned my YouTube site. I keep all these posted on there so uh, your, your, your listeners can 
um, definitely go to my YouTube and uh, see a lot of what our students are doing. Um, and the results from these projects are similar to what you're familiar with. They're probably, I'm, I'm assuming, a lot of your listeners as well, where they're decreasing, our students are decreasing the time it takes to do processes by, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 uh, percent time simultaneously improving quality, uh, reducing costs, um, doing this just by rearranging the way the, the work is, uh, the way the work is, is done. So I've got lots of examples up there, but I'll tell you one of my, one of my favorite ones uh, came from a, a couple of semesters ago. I had a student, uh, she came up to me and she said, I've got this idea for a project, but I'm not sure if, you know, if I can do it. She said, my, um, my dad owns uh, a mechanic shop, a car repair shop, and one of the things he does all the time is, is uh, rebuilds transmissions. And she says, I think that there's a lot of opportunity for improvement. She said, but, um, and you know, I talked to my dad about it and he's willing to have us come in. Uh, but I, she said, I've never, I don't know anything about rebuilding transmissions. Like, I don't know what this is all about. Um, and when I told my dad, hey, can, we, can I bring a student group in and, and help to improve this process? Uh, then his response to her was, um, well, sure, you know, I, I'm happy to help you however I can, but I just want to let you know, you probably won't be able to improve it much because I've been doing this as my career for the past 20 years. Of course. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've already improved it as much as I can improve it, but <laughs> if it helps your project group, you can come in and, and you know, take a look at it. I'll, he was just being supportive, so love it. So um, I told her, I said, look, all you have to do is be able to see waste. I'll help coach you through it. Um, and, uh, you know, and, but the deal is you cannot improve that process because you don't know anything about rebuilding transmissions. I said, this is, this is the one time in college where you can get your parents to do your homework for you. What you need to do <laughs> is you need to train your dad how to be able to see waste so that he can suggest ways of improving that you're going to be there to coach and your team will be there to coach and to help implement. But, um, but a lot of these ideas are going to need to come from the process owner. So you're going to really have to be there and create that trust with him. So I was trying to train her to, to have that management viewpoint. So anyway, the team went in, they did great. Uh, you know, looking, they just looked for waste. It was just obvious stuff. Like where do you keep tools? Where do you keep parts? When you take the transmission apart, where do you put the parts? How do you get them back? You know, and where are you doing activities? Where are tables located? Whatever that was. So anyway, they worked with him to rearrange that process and reduced the time it takes to, for him to rebuild a transmission by 60%. Wow. 60%. Just amazing. And so, um, you know, I thought it was a great thing and, and uh, uh, their, their process. I'm sure the dad was also surprised. Absolutely. I, in fact, and their process video is one of those that's up on, on YouTube that you can see, but um, yeah, he wrote me a letter afterward and said, you know, this project, it was just amazing for me to be able to see the waste that was in my process. And now I see that there's lots of opportunities in my shop to make similar improvements, you know, cause this is real money for, yeah. for him. That's real money um, being in his own shop and it's improving quality at the same time, instead of, you know, forgetting about parts or forgetting about bolts, they're all where they're absolutely needed to be able to put the, the thing back together. Um, so he was definitely, um, uh, definitely convinced at, at the yeah. conclusion of that. But that's very similar to a lot of our student projects. Just love, he love hearing those stories. That's fantastic. And I love your approach where rather than telling your students to analyze a process and improve it and then make suggestions to whoever is performing the job, you're teaching them to teach others, which is great. It's essential to, the, to what is at the very core of Lean, uh, educating to educate. Absolutely. That's fantastic. Hey, this has been a great conversation. Where can I, people find you, whether it's online or physically? Where can they learn more about you? I, I know that you're active on Twitter and YouTube. Where else? So I'm, uh, they can reach me, find me on LinkedIn, uh, find me on Twitter at Lean Kaizen. Uh, that's, that, by the way, that's, that's a great handle. So at Lean Kaizen, right? At Lean Kaizen and then on YouTube as well. Um, and I can provide you with that link. Yeah. And in YouTube, if they search for Bradley Miller, they'll find you. You're, they'll find your channel with great examples of how you can apply lean tools and principles in your day-to-day -day life. That's right. Well, fantastic. Brad, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for being here with us today. And I hope to continue the conversation in another occasion as well.
All right. Thanks a lot. I was glad to be here. Thanks. This show is brought to you by Rever, the digitized Kaizen platform for industrial companies. Rever allows you to engage and recognize all of your frontline employees for executing daily improvement ideas instead of merely suggesting them and to share and reuse best practices across sites and teams. All of the results and benefits are then automatically tracked and visualized in the Rever platform. Global companies trust Rever to drive continuous improvement and digital transformation. Thanks for listening. We'd love to share critical insights on key areas that directly impact the success of your continuous improvement program. Go to leanfrontline.com to talk to an expert today. Don't forget, the front line is waiting.